Oh, and arrest and crucifixion, he prayed uh, to God the Father. And in his prayer, he prayed first off for himself. Look at John 17, uh, beginning with verse 1. It says, These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world. He also prayed for his disciples. Uh, if you look at verse 9, he says, and I pray for them, I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are mine. Uh, then he prayed uh, for all future believers. Go down to verse 20. Uh, he said, neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be perfect, or be made perfect in one, that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved me, and as thou hast loved me. Love them, and thou hast loved me. This prayer if you really look at it, it's a remarkable prayer. Uh, we learn what weighed heavily on Jesus' heart and on his mind, knowing that the hour uh, of fulfillment had come, the hour that he was going to be taken and the hour that he was going to be uh, paraded and found guilty and, and nailed to a cross. He, he sought to, to be glorified by God uh, he was concerned about the well-being of his disciples, and he wanted his followers uh, to be unified even as he and God were one. And in that unity, uh, I really want to take a look at tonight, uh, and the title of the lesson is, is That the World May Know. And I think through unity and, and that the Bible talks about, the world will know if you're unified together. Uh, why do you think that unity was so important to Christ? Uh, what has Jesus done that uh, unity be accomplished? Well, in our divided world today, especially in our religious divided world, uh, think about it. How can we maintain unity among those who believe in Jesus? Everybody believes in a different fashion. Everybody doesn't believe and are not obedient to the same doctrine. Uh, without unity, it's difficult to, persu to persuade uh, that to unbelievers that Jesus really is the Son of God and that He came from God. There's so many in the world that, that care little about doctrine today. Uh, and distinction of the doctrine but in our world of, of ethical and racial and cultural divisions uh, I think unity can catch people's attention because we're so divided as human beings that, that live in this world now this is not to say that doctrine is not important because it is uh, Jesus had already emphasized the importance of abiding in his word. If you look at John 8, beginning with verse 30, he says, And as he spake these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. So his doctrine was important. Uh, and he says, if you continue in my words, uh, not someone else's words. So doctrine was important to, to Jesus. And when we're unified together, it gives us credence, if you will, and substance to our claims of Christ and in following him and being obedient to his word because he was sent by God. 
and that as the Son of God, we know that uh, if we're unified together, we read in the Scriptures how He was uh, died on the cross and how He was raised from the dead and, and uh, overcome death, and now He lives at the right hand of God. In other words, he's, he's transformed our lives by what we believe and, and how we're unified together. Uh, not everyone believes those things. And when Christ returns, the faith will, will be unified again with Christ. They'll really be unified with Him in spirit. They'll dwell with Him forever in heaven. But uh, I think if we look ahead being spiritually unified with Christ is is really the final step for us uh, why is it so important that Christ emphasized it to his disciples so as to convince an, an unbelieving world that unity was important well I believe that so that they may know God, that they may know that God sent Jesus, that, that God loves them and, and desires them uh, to have a home in heaven, desires to give them salvation. If we look at 1 John 4, beginning with verse 9, it says, In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through it. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. What a wonderful message that we have to share with the world. Uh, God loves us even as He loved His Son, but to convince an unbelieving world, uh, we have to be unified together. We have to have the same message. We have to uh, worship the same and live our lives the same. Uh, in reading this prayer of Jesus for unity, uh, I don't think a true disciple can be content with looking at the world and seeing all the religious division in the world today and be okay with it. Uh, I don't think there's any way that we can uh, be okay with it. Uh, I think it's our duty and our devotion to Christ to... Uh, Oppose any teaching that's not according to the teachings of Christ and to uh, the New Testament. Uh, you may ask, well, how can we be one as Christ and the Father were one? You know, here are some thoughts on that. Uh, Jesus has provided glory for us to be one. He certainly provided a way. If you look at John 17 and, and verse 22, he says, And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, uh, that they may be one, even as we are one. So what is this glory? It says, And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them. Uh, Christ received glory. Uh, he gave glory to those that uh, were obedient to him. Uh, his disciples why to enable them to be one just as he and the father are one now what is this glory to what jesus is referring to well there's a lot of thoughts on on what it really refers to but i think it's a reference to the joy and the happiness uh, of a christian and, and being obedient to god uh, the glory and when we do that we glorify God we glorify the Son of God uh, it's the hope that we have uh, the hope of an eternal home with with God with Christ for all eternity uh, and that through the Word of God and, and abiding in the gospel of Christ will one day be made perfect uh, in one person and it'll be all fulfilled in Christ when he comes to receive us uh, it'll truly Everyone will be unified, that's his children, into one spirit. We'll all be in the same place. Um, as we live out our lives here on this earth, uh, I think the, the world will see differences in our lives uh, if we're living for Christ. Uh, John 17 and 23 uh, says, I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved me as thou hast loved me. I love them, sent them, 
love them as thou hast loved me. I think by being unified and being together in the correct doctrine and in the obedience of that doctrine, we show the world just who we are and what we stand for, that we're children of God. Uh, certainly without our abiding in Jesus, we, we have nothing and we can do nothing. John 15 and, and verse 4 and 5 says, Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. We certainly can't do anything without Christ. Uh, we simply can't have the glory that He has said that he, he received from God and that He will give us. We can't have that without the unity in Christ. Uh, where does that unity really come from? I mean, why, why, why was Jesus stressing that unity right before He went to the cross? Well, that unity really comes from His death. Uh, his willingness to be obedient to God and be unified in giving himself as a sacrifice for the sins of the world. Uh, not everyone of that day accepted that. And people today, and many people, still don't accept that. Without that sacrifice, there is no way that we could begin to have any kind of unity with Christ. Paul spoke about it in Ephesians 2, beginning with verse 14. He says, For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make to himself of twain one new man, so making peace and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enemy thereby, or enemy thereby. The division between the Jews and the Gentile ended at the cross. Uh, Jesus died to make it possible for everyone to be a part of the one body. Ephesians 4 and 4 says there is one body, one spirit, and one hope. Uh, when we come to Christ through obedience to His gospel, we are united with all other believers in the body of Christ. Uh, we are baptized into that one body. Uh, we had a baptism this morning. Uh, we're all baptized into the same body, and that's the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12 and 13 says, Whether Jew or Gentile, we are baptized into one body. Uh, that's unity. Uh, being together, being one. Uh, and when we obey the gospel, we begin that Christian life united with all our brothers and sisters who have obeyed the gospel, who have submitted and, and come together in unity through baptism. When it comes to obtaining unity, Jesus accomplished uh, the unity uh, which he prayed for. Our challenge is maintaining it. Uh, he set forth the standard. Uh, our challenge is just to maintain it uh, if we want to be faithful and if we want to glorify God and honor Christ. And this challenge requires that we be obedient to His doctrine, not anything else. That we be of one mind and one heart when it comes to obeying the doctrine of Christ, that we keep to that. Uh, it, it's impossible without adherence to the same standard. And, and Christ didn't say, uh, I'm going to throw out here all these different standards and as long as you pick one of them, you're okay. He wanted us to be of the same heart, same mind, the same body. If there wasn't standards regarding things, this world would be in a mess. We know what standards are. Uh, when you go to the grocery store and you go back and buy vegetables, you have to weigh these vegetables if you want to know what they weigh. Uh, if the scales didn't weigh cor correctly, or, or somebody had fixed the scales to weigh, weigh in correctly, it'd be a mess. There's no standard to go by. Uh, when we get gas at the gas pump, if there was no standard uh, to register how much gas we got and how much it cost, we'd be up to somebody's mercy just to say, hey, you pull up and fill me up, and they just charge you whatever they wanted. Uh, can you understand and see why standards are important? Uh, 
even in this world to us, standards are important, but they're vitally important when it comes to God's kingdom and when it comes to unity. Religious division occurs because people accept different standards uh, when it comes to religion. Some people accept the authority of, of, of man. Uh, or a prophet uh, that they say this person's a prophet or a preacher I've heard people say well I believe because this this preacher told me uh, rather than opening the Bible and finding out for themselves and being unified by that one doctrine but I, I one thing is for certain we can't maintain unity uh, for which Jesus died unless we can agree on the same standard. We have to agree and be obedient to the same standard. For us as Christians, our authority and our standard can only be that which originated with the Son of God, uh, with Christ, because He paid the price for that standard and that unity. Uh, Jesus said in John 8, 31, If you continue in my word, then you are my disciple. It's pretty clear that that's the standard, His Word. And if you continue in it, you're my disciple. Matthew 28 and 18 says, All power is given to me in heaven and in earth. And with that power, His words and will was uh, delegated by inspiration of the Holy Spirit to His apostles. Uh, John 13 and verse 20 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that receiveth whomsoever I send receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth, receiveth him that sent me. Uh, his words were proclaimed by his apostles. Uh, his words were taught by the apostles. So we must be very careful to observe all that he commanded and all that's written and not allow the traditions of, of men to make void the, the commandments of God because that's what happens when we do that. When we take someone's word instead of adhering to the standard that God wants us to take, then we make void the commandments of God. We need to separate ourselves from, from doctrine of uninspired people and uninspired men and adhere to the doctrine of, of God. Uh, you know, we have to keep this unity and we have to be faithful until life's end. There's no quitting. There's no stopping. The Apostles' Doctrine came from God, so uh, must ours uh, through His Holy Word. The Bible is our standard of authority uh, in all religious matters. Uh, not just to pick and choose, but in all religious matters. It requires that we follow the example of Christ not the example of someone else. Paul told the Philippians in chapter 2, be like-minded, be of one accord and of one mind. He told the Ephesians over in chapter 4, keep the unity of the Spirit. There is one body, one Spirit, one hope of your calling. Uh, without following the examples of Christ, without following His words, we'll destroy that unity. It'll be gone. It'll be void. Uh, he obtained it and glorified it with God through the, His suffering and dying on the cross. Uh, we have Christ's doctrine before us today. Lives can be transformed by uh, adherence and obedience to, to this doctrine. Uh, and that makes proof to the world that we're unified. When you follow His doctrine, when you submit through obedience uh, to become His child and you follow that doctrine, that's proof that you're a Christian. That's proof that you're unified with Christ. If you obey the gospel and then go your own way, that doesn't prove anything. But what proves it is your adherence to the gospel day after day after day and the Word of God. Uh, I truly believe that it's in the context of, of each congregation uh, that unity be the most evident. Uh, you know, all of these congregations of the Lord's Church were established all around in the early days of Christianity. Corinth, Galatia, Jerusalem. Uh, that's where the interaction of Christians mostly occurs. Uh, that's where the unity can build. Uh, the habits can be formed and study and learning and the following of this doctrine is when we assemble together uh, in, in, as a congregation does. We must never be guilty of accepting any part of, of religious error. Uh, 
our first concern must be to preserve unity and in our own selves and our congregation and and uh, the Lord's church. Uh, I think it probably is one of the most sad and most pitiful things to condemn other religious divisions and then not have unity at home. Uh, we have it here. I'm not saying that. I'm saying as mankind. You know, there's a lot of people say uh, in their congregation, do as I say, not as I do, uh, when it comes to, to unity and, and following God. Uh, in the New Testament, each congregation was self-governed. They were independent. They had no oversight of, of a uh, uh, governing body. Uh, each congregation was governed by the elders within that congregation whose authority was limited uh, to the flock of God amongst that congregation. Uh, there was no authority above that local congregation other than Christ and God. That didn't last too long. Uh, that's the way God intended it, but it didn't last too long. It wasn't until about... Uh, all the apostles had died it's probably in the second century uh, that the church came to uh, have a single person and at that time he was called a bishop that would oversee the uh, congregation uh, later it became known and was changed from bishop to pope uh, and I'm making a reference to uh, the church at Rome, a Catholic church. Uh, they gave it that name. <clears throat> the word Catholic, <clears throat> excuse me, just means that it was different. Uh, the church at Rome was really hindered by the Roman government. Uh, and so after the fall of Rome, the, what was left decided, hey, we, if we're going to support the church and if we're going to have anybody participate, then we're going to have to let everybody know that it's not the church at Rome anymore. Uh, so they gave it the name, came up with the name of Catholic, which means a different, something different. Uh, a lot of people, though, the whole problem was a lot of these people that were in the original church at Rome who caused havoc with the church, who wanted to limit the church and have them to be obedient to uh, local laws and different man-made laws uh, were still there. And they became a part of this new church. And so a lot of things uh, in time didn't change. Uh, they didn't. Uh, about 400 A.D., uh, the bishops in Rome began to exercise authority over all the different congregations. That's not what God had set up. That's not the way God uh, intended it. Uh, these changes were not only unscriptural, but they set the stage for uh, the many divisions in the world that we see today. Uh, it is so important to understand that we as disciples disciples of Christ can't treat uh, religious division as a matter of choice. Uh, we can't be unified uh, as a matter of choice. We can only be unified truly when we're together in one as the Bible says. Uh, it's contrary to the Lord's prayer for, for unity if we allow uh, unity with contradictions and and division. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 3 and 4 that these divisions were carnal. That's, and he's talking about the divisions that were caused by man and mankind. They're carnal. Uh, so as a disciple of Christ, our primary concern is and should be that of Christ and what he's established and what he has done. He died on the cross to obtain that unity. Uh, huge price. Uh, because without his death on the cross, we couldn't be in that one church, the Lord's church. We couldn't be washed in that blood, that one blood of Christ. Uh, 
He died on the cross to obtain unity. He believed it. It would convince the world that he came from God. And I believe it has convinced many in the world that Christ is the Son of God and that he came from God. But since Jesus died uh, and did obtain unity through his death, our task as Christians today is to maintain that unity, not let it get polluted, but to maintain it. Uh, we must display his teachings and teach his teachings and, and uh, study his word. Uh, never give in to unscriptural teachings and unscriptural doctrines which cause divisions. Uh, you know, divisions and the lack of unity will put us in an area that is so displeasing to God. Uh, my hope is that everyone here today is a Christian and, and that's part of the unity of God that we be his child that we be unified together and, and I hope that everyone here today is a Christian and that they're unified with God uh, but if there's one present that is not a Christian this evening I'd certainly love to give you an opportunity to obey the gospel knowing that Christ died for the unity that we're so blessed to have and that uh, we can continue with on this earth until he comes back. Um, this unity will allow us this wonderful hope in heaven for all eternity. Hey, if you're here and you're not a Christian, I would hope that you would want to become a Christian. And if you are a Christian that's maybe fallen away, I would certainly hope that you would want to come back uh, to your first love. Uh, as we stand and sing this song of encouragement, if you have a need, please, please respond. All to Jesus.